Hi, I'm Peter Miller. I'm Dean of the Bard Graduate Center, and I'm here today with Laura Liebman, Professor of English and Humanities at Reed College and the author of the forthcoming Art of the Jewish Family, A History of Women in Early New York in Five Objects, published by the Bard Graduate Center in its Cultural Histories of the Material World series. Laura was Leon Levy Foundation Professor of Jewish Material Culture at the Bard Graduate Center in 2018, uh, where she taught a course and gave a series of public lectures which have been transformed into this wonderful book, uh, which we're here uh, to celebrate today. Uh, Laura, let me ask you a question. Um, you use material culture to tell stories that couldn't be told before. Uh, and in this book, your uh, subjects happen to be Jewish, though you started your career working on Native American history. So I'm interested just to start off with the question of um, what kind of prospects you think this, um, this kind of approach offers to Jewish studies as a field? Yeah, so one of the things that has been true about Jewish studies in general is that when we talk about Jewish material culture, we tend to mean Judaica, so which at least before 1840 would translate roughly into things like Torah pointers or Torah mantles or Kiddush cups. So objects that were used by men in rituals. And that necessarily has a limiting factor on who is at the center of Judaism. So in this book, I'm really trying to shift the locus away from the synagogue and into the familial sphere. And I'm looking more at the Jewishness embedded in more quotidian objects, particularly those owned by women. And in doing so, I feel like I'm really not just asking us to think about how are objects themselves gendered, but also how do certain notions of authority over who gets to interpret what is Jewishness or who has authority to speak is inherently part of the history of what objects were deemed important. And this, I hope, will be something that will be really interesting to people throughout the field of Jewish studies, that one of the big topics that has come up recently, raised by scholars like Jennifer Thompson and Suzanne Heschel and Sarah Imhoff, has really been that Jewish studies, like many other fields, the journals in our fields tend to be disproportionately featuring male scholars. And in addition, even when women have published a lot in a particular area, that they will be cited less than other people. And really what I'm trying to do in this book is try and get at that history of how has archiving and silences and authority been something that's been developing over time as opposed to just being a recent problem. Hmm. How, how did you come to working on Jews in the Americas, the title of a, of a book you edited, um, from your uh, prior work on sort of Native American populations in the 17th uh, and 18th centuries? Yeah, so I had been working on Native American communities, both in my dissertation and in my first book in colonial New England. And I really think of myself as a scholar who works on the colonies as opposed to, or in early America, as opposed to like one particular ethnic group. And uh, when I was finishing up that book on Colonial Martha's Vineyard, that I was sort of looking around thinking of what would be another interesting community to study. And given my background, and I was married now to somebody who was Sephardic, and so I was interested in like, hey, what are Sephardic Jews doing? There's a big community in Newport, which is where I was studying at that time. And I was really interested in how that community was different from what I had been looking at with Native American communities. Um, one of the things that I discovered was, unlike the Wampanoag community that I'd been working on, the Native American, the Jewish communities didn't really stay put. So I'd have a list of people that I was studying, and I'd look at the next census, and half of them would be gone. And I was sort of like, what happened to all my people? Like, where did they go? And the answer was, they were moving around the Jewish world. So I'd often find they were in the Caribbean, or they'd gone back to London, or they'd gone to Amsterdam. That really became the focus of that first book, that I was drawing a lot of the material culture practices that I developed in my work in Native American studies and using it for Jewish studies, but it really became something where I was interested in larger patterns of cultural change across different geographic areas. And I think you can see that in this book as well. So 
not only it's on New York, but you'll notice these women have backstories. Very few of them are actually born in New York. They're coming from all these different places and they're moving around constantly. And that really is the story of Jews in early America. They're not people who tended to stay in one place for their entire lives, but really are part of these vast connections across space. So just building on that, final question. Um, what is then the role of New York as a place? If the characters come and go and move around, what's, what is um, added to your story by this particular place? And how does, just to, to sort of think out loud, how does the mobility of the inhabitants of the place also give character to what is constant in the place? Yeah, so I think there's, there is some way in which talking about New York for Jewish communities for between 1750 and 1850 is a little bit anachronistic in that New York doesn't become like Jewish America, you know, so important until the 1880s and afterwards. So there's something odd about choosing it for this time period. But I would say that anachronism actually points to why New York as a place is so helpful for thinking about representative communities. And that's for two reasons. The first one is because it's not yet the place. Um, one colonial letter talks about New York as a small town near Newport, Rhode Island, which really gives you a sense like of the difference of colonial geographies, right? So it, it really is similar to these other places in that it's a port town. It's a place where people are making marriages, connecting to other places and people are constantly moving around. But the second way that it's um, not representative, I think actually speaks to why it becomes so important for studying Jewish material culture, because of that later history after the 1880s, New York becomes the place where the first American Jewish Historical Society gets set up and where we have early Jewish museums. So it really becomes a collecting place for early Jewish material culture. And in that sense, very much rightfully is the place to begin a study about how are people creating archives? How are people creating collections? What is the afterlife of objects that once belonged in early America? Laura Liebman, thank you very much. We've been talking about uh, your book, Art of the Jewish Family, A History of Women in Early New York in Five Objects, published by the Bard Graduate Center. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Peter.